Welcome to the History of Science Society Centennial Podcast on HSS Publications. My name is Sigrid Schmalzer. I am a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. My own research focuses on the history of science in modern China, but I'm here today facilitating this discussion uh, in the capacity of past chair of the Committee on Publications for the History of Science Society. And today we have an excellent panel for extraordinary scholars of the history of science. Two are the current editors of ISIS and the History of Science Society's editors, uh, Alex Huey and Matt Levine, both of Mississippi State University, and they started their term in 2019. We also have the new editors who are coming in starting their term next year in 2024. And they are Elise Burton of uh, University of Toronto and Projit Mukherjee of Ashoka University. So welcome to all of you. I'm really excited for this conversation on the past, present, and future of the History of Science Society's publications. And I thought we would begin today with a question for Alex and Matt. You broke new ground for the History of Science Society by becoming the first to edit as a team in the past the editors of ISIS had always edited solo, but you are two co-editors. You work together closely. You're in the same department, and we can imagine that you had a vision for what you wanted to do with the journal ISIS and with the History of Science Society publications more generally. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you decided to take this on and how you envisioned yourself steering ISIS, the society, and by extension, the whole field through your service as society editors. I would say Matt has been my, my second oldest Starkville friend. We started here the same year as you know little baby assistant professors, and we actually shared a house for a while. Our offices were across the hall from each other. So, so we had to be good colleagues, and I feel like we've had really nice rapport ever since. We initially, when that call went out for new editors or expressions of interest, Neither of us said anything, but our department head sent it to us again and said, are you interested in this? Which meant you are interested in this. And we had a, a conversation about it and I think agreed that we were only interested in it if we could do it as a team. I, you know, you, you mentioned that we were, we were breaking ground being the first sort of co-editorship. My read of the room then and probably still now was there was a lot of skepticism about this. And COP was very skeptical. The previous editors, you know, way back, several lines were skeptical. And we had to write like an additional kind of defense of our plan and come up with a whole workflow. So it was, it took a while. I mean, it made sense to us, but we also had to kind of articulate how it was going to work in practice, which was a nice exercise, actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. This, this is Matt, and, and hello to everyone, by the way. <laughs> there was a lot of skepticism, I think. We, we heard some of that, and, and, and I think those, those questions were, were totally fair. That having been said, having done this for a few years now, I don't know if it is even possible for somebody who is doing anything else in academia to, to do a job of, of this magnitude. Our, our immediate predecessor, Floris Cohen, was, uh, was retired from teaching, although he, he still continues to do research. And so he may have had a little more time in his day to, to devote to that. But even then, I think you know he had a, he had a very large staff, and, and I, I'm just not sure it, it's it's even possible to to do this kind of of work as a as a single person, if only because you only then have a single point of view. And and one of the things that's been really helpful for for Alex and, and me is is to always have that other voice in our ear, always have, and and we push back against each other, you know, uh, quite a lot. We have not yet encountered the situation which was much discussed in our uh, probationary period, our, our application period, as to what happens when we are finally once and for all at loggerheads. I keep telling people if that ever comes up, I'll just you know we'll just do what Alex wants, um, and I, I think that's a good policy. But uh, Sigurd, you, you mentioned you know uh, you imagine that we uh, had a vision for the journal, and I think that's that's a great way of of putting it. You're free to imagine that if you like. Uh, I'm not sure it's actually come to fruition in any of the ways we expected, but it's really been it's been great, I think, to have more than just one voice in the room. Uh, and that that's the real benefit. 
That's that's great. I do want to push you on that the question of your vision, though, because I think you know I've heard you talk many times about your admiration for your predecessors, and so this isn't at all you know saying that you somehow thought things were going terribly and you wanted to you know radically transform the journal or the society's publications. But nonetheless, you know, when you come into you know leadership of any position. No doubt you had some, you know, thoughts about, you know, where you wanted to take it, you know, ideas for moving it forward in a new direction or strengthening certain areas uh, or adapting to changes in the field or, you know, I I can think of of many other ways to frame it. But uh, just if you could say more about what you hoped you would uh, be able to do it with this position and what you hoped your legacy would be uh, as as editors. First, I should remind everyone that just listened to Sigurd's introduction that uh, we took over in 2019. And many of you probably remember what happened in the spring of 2020. Um, so lots of visions by lots of people over many journals got a bit scuttled or disrupted and I think our journal has actually managed really well. ISIS and, and Osiris and, and the CB, everything, you know, has weathered this, the disruption of the pandemic uh, extremely well. And I'm really proud, actually, of, of how we did. But I will say, you know, of course, you know, we, we were thinking about broadening the definition of science and who does science and what science is and where it happens and when it happens and all of that. But for me, and maybe for Matt also, what I was really interested in was the the limits of our power. What what can what can editors do to change sort of the culture of a society, of a discipline? Certainly there's the publications that are created, but is there something more subtle going on in the background in terms of collegiality and sharing and working together and support? And and I think that's something that that Matt and I, you know, that was what we could bring to this. And we thought very long and hard in our application. And then as we were kind of flailing around and trying to pivot during the early stages of the pandemic, thinking about what we could do. I mean, in some ways, the pandemic kind of underscored where the opportunities were because suddenly everything got remote. And since we're already kind of working remotely anyway as editors, this you know this allowed us to kind of throw all of our energy into creating this sort of work in the office practicum that we developed and, and things like that. And just sort of a general, you know, trying to communicate really clearly through emails, which sounds really dry, but adding more exclamation points to, you know, everything we send. And yeah, just a, a general kind of interest in seeing what, you know, can an editor actually facilitate something like a cultural shift or, you know, create the foundation for that um, has been something I've been especially interested in. And, um, and I'll just I'll just add. So I mean, Alex and I are of you know the 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 succeeding scholarly generation from our predecessor Floris Cohen. So you know, any, anyone might expect that we would have you know uh, just that kind of generational difference of perspective. But even if there were you know some sort of like huge gulf between where we stand and and see the journal and see the field versus what what Floris did, and I don't really think there is. It, one of the things that that the the last four years have made clear, even without the pandemic, is how much uh, our journal, our field is being pulled along by circumstances. A lot will necessarily have changed in the last four years. And again, setting aside the pandemic, questions about open access, questions about you know where where really is the direction of the field going? What what is the consensus? You know, historiographical default. Uh, that, that we're working from. These things change under everyone's feet, regardless of, of of your scholarly generation or anything like that. So just reminding ourselves that that we need to sort of keep our footing in, in all that has, has been really important for us. And, and it's actually been very helpful to refer to and to speak with Floris, to talk to Bernie, um, to talk with Margaret Rossiter recently about their experiences. They're still relevant. Hello, everyone. So I'm Elise Burton, one of the incoming editors of ISIS. And I would like the opportunity to ask a question of Alex and Matt. So you mentioned that a lot of the things that you had in mind for ISIS had to be set aside because of the contingencies of the pandemic. Uh, But I just want to ask in a more general sense, even if the pandemic hadn't happened, 
what were some of the things, the major challenges that you didn't expect to face um, coming in as uh, new editors to ISIS? And do you have any brief tips for incoming editors? That's a really great question. The thing that that always comes to mind for me is that, and I, this this is going to make me sound naive, but then I, I was naive. I honestly thought when we when we you know got the the keys to it all that we'd be spending most of our time, our editorial time, just sort of perusing these great works of scholarship and stroking our chins and 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 you know making these grand pronouncements and assessments, and and that is. There's a lot of that, of course, that has to happen. We have to we have to read things very carefully. We have to, you know, we we really do have to think about these things a great deal and and think about what other people have said about them. But as with everything in academia, there is so much admin on top of that. There are so many emails and so many meetings, and it's it's inescapable. So, you know, uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, sort of fantastic notions I had that this was just going to be an exercise in, you know, in, in pure intellectual, whatever, you know, had, had to fall by the wayside, but that that's okay. Because I'm, I'm not sure that, that you can really keep up that pace for very long anyway. Yeah. I always thought that we would have sort of related to what Matt said, that we would be able to craft each issue, you know, so that the different articles spoke to each other and they drew on the, you know, the book reviews and that this was going to be, each one was going to be this like carefully curated you know, object. And we never, and I don't know if it was a pandemic or if this is just sort of the way it is for every journal that with ISIS, at least we never felt like we were, you know, we were always running up against deadlines. And I will say, we're very proud that we have always released our issue on time, like at the, and sometimes even early, we're, we're actually getting, you know, kind of a little bit early on things, but through all the disruption and upheaval, which, you know, like the press itself had, you know, real issues like, they had to do social distancing in the actual press room where they're like, you know, running the machine. So we were, um, we were running up against deadlines and, um, and in the end, I think we were, we were, you know, we were just so pleased with the articles that we were publishing that it, you know, it didn't make sense to delay things just in order to craft, you know, these, each issue as its own thing. So hopefully readers found something, lots of things to read in every single issue. I will say also related to this, to your question, Elise, I was surprised, and maybe I shouldn't have been, by how much time, you know, so we're ex officio members of the executive committee. And this, again, it may have been the pandemic, but there's a lot of executive committee work. HSS executive committee does a lot of work <laughs> and they meet a lot. Yeah, I think I think maybe just to, to follow up on this a little bit, a lot of what we learned was what we don't need to be doing or or where our help isn't needed or or wanted or in any event essential. Um, one of the grand plans we had was that we were going to really put the HSS website on the map. Um, we were going to make it, you know, your one-stop shop for all things internet history of science. To the extent that that's happened, it's because we have, uh, you know, JP uh, as, as our new executive director who has actually made that happen. Turns out it's really hard to just make a website apropos of nothing. Turns out you can't just generate content uh, by by simply asking people. That was, you know, that was a lesson we had to learn. Most, mostly, mostly that's that's my fault. So there's there's a lot that we might do that we haven't done, but it's been a question of sort of picking where we can make the most uh, influence. From my perspective, just sitting on the Committee on Publications, the practicum was something that felt very innovative and felt like something that's a, you know, a real legacy that you both are leaving. Another one that I'll just plant the seed for is the emphasis that you placed on not just what uh, fields in the history of science, what areas of the world, what topics are being focused on, but also who is uh, contributing. And I really appreciated the reports that you sent, especially looking at gender equity uh, in terms of who was submitting and who uh, felt confident enough to resubmit after getting a you know revise and resubmit. So uh, one, I'm wondering if you could talk about both of those things and any other things that you felt you, you know, you have introduced uh, as editors um, of the society. Sure, we can talk about those a little bit. So the, the practicum for the listeners that don't know, which is probably most people, 
is something that we started that we modified over the course of the pandemic and and sort of the realities of, of running the journal. We had initially thought that we would sort of frame it as like an internship and someone would come down to Starkville and like live here for like six weeks and follow us around and use the archives here if there was, you know, something at Mississippi State that, you know, was, was going to be essential for their dissertations. And that didn't, you know, the more we thought about it, we're like, I don't know what, the, how appealing that's going to be. And then with the pandemic, it was like clearly not doable. And so we thought maybe we could do it instead in a online sort of virtual form, and then we could include more people. And we each year it's what, seven or eight people? Is that right? It's less than a dozen. Seven, yeah. And we they sit in on our weekly, we have these 90 minute, two hour office meetings every Friday morning, which is why you all, why, why various people that are involved in the journal get emails Friday afternoon because we're sitting down and going through our punch list. But they sit in on that meeting, the sort of organizational, but then they also spend two hours a week with Matt and I and various other people, whether they're representatives from COP or the manuscript editor. And we sort of work through the, the life cycle of an of a article and the reviews that come in. So the idea is to get a real sense of what goes on in the office and the kinds of decisions that we have to make and how we work our way through them. The other goal besides that was to start building a network for the the people that participate. So they are in touch with each other. Um, We're now having sort of every, we have little meetups at HSS every year um, with the whole group so that it's sort of growing each year and there's like alumni. And, you know, hopefully these are um, the sort of next generation of, of leaders within the society. That's, that's the goal. So we, we were surprised, you know, the first time we tried it, we, we probably had 50 applicants and then we had like 70 the next year and we had a lot. We had, we had to actually select people, which we weren't expecting. Did you want us to talk a little bit more about demographics as well? Yes, okay. definitely. And, you know, the efforts that you made to track that and to, you know, think about how the society can encourage more people from underrepresented groups to contribute and to follow through and get published in the in our publications. First, what should be said is that under Flores, they were also tracking gender, the rates of submission based on gender and, and acceptance and all of that. Um, and they were reporting just to the Women's Caucus, I think, is my understanding. And we initially, you know, we're going to sort of continue that or, you know, we hadn't had much time to think about it when the pandemic hit. There was this anecdotal evidence during the early stages of the pandemic that women scholars were being affected significantly more by the lockdowns. And there was real concern that their scholarship, you know, productivity rate was going to was going to you know fall off. And, and there was evidence of that again, anecdotally. So we decided to kind of track that, see if we were seeing that just in the first six months of the pandemic. So we, you know, we took a slice, you know, January to March and then March to to June and we were seeing it for sure. So then we kept collecting this information and, and we then pushed to, to expand the demographic categories that we were looking at. We actually built in those of you that have, have worked, you know, with editorial manager to submit something. Um, to ISIS recently probably noticed that you now have to work through a page and because we're con- trying to collect as much demographic information as we can along the way in order. But now it's become this huge, you know, sort of statistical, <laughs> we have too much data. So it, it's actually harder to to run and um, and analyze this material at this point. But we're we're collecting it and with the intent of then, you know, being able to see some broader trends over you know, five years, 10 years, things like that. But, you know, the initial goal when we were publishing this information and we would release a report, you know, every six months to the society membership was exactly this, to, you know, to make people aware that this was happening, you know, within history of science and hopefully, you know, to encourage more people that were sitting on R&Rs to to get them turned back in and to recognize that they you know, that they, that we were supportive of, of trying to get something, you know, closer to, to equity and something that represented the membership um, as far as what gets published in ISIS. So we're still working on it. You know, it's, it, we haven't, the ship hasn't totally righted um, and gotten back to where it was before the pandemic, but it's, it's getting closer. Great. Okay. Thanks. So I also, you know, have had the privilege of learning about the vision of the incoming editors uh, through the application that you put in and through uh, conversations during the interview process as the committee was 
assessing your vision and deciding, you know, that uh, we very much wanted to encourage that vision. And so I just wanted to invite Elise Burton and Protein Mukherjee to talk about what you see as, you know, the, the way that you not only see the field changing, but maybe hope that the field will change and what role you see yourselves having as editors in, in moving us in, in new directions. And I'm you know, thinking in, in particular that you know, following along the line of whose work is, is represented in our publications um, and you know, also work on what parts of the world. So you know, questions of, of representation, um, I would say, but feel free to talk about other aspects of your vision as well. I think to start off, I'd like to say that both Projit and I come from a similar kind of background and training in the sense that we were not originally trained to think of ourselves as historians of science. We both come from a tradition of area study scholarship, myself in Middle Eastern studies, Projit in South Asian studies. And so when we first came to history of science as a discipline, it was somewhat from the position of outsiders, um, or rather as people who are adding on to the geographic scope of a discipline which otherwise thinks of um, its most important sort of theoretical basis as as being rooted in Europe um, and then later in, in North America. And so a big important part of what we're hoping to do as editors is kind of smooth the way for other people who might be on the journey that that we're having to really expand the scope of who thinks of themselves as a historian of science by more prominently featuring in our publications at the History of Science of Society, big argument-driven scholarship that is actually rooted in sources and geographies outside of Europe and North America. And so I, um, I wasn't initially sure that I was ready at this point in my career to apply for editorship of ISIS, but it was Projit who actually approached me with a really clear vision for doing the, the kind of thing that I just mentioned. So I'd like to turn over to Projit now um, to talk about how he convinced me um, to take on uh, the role of, of incoming co-editors. So Projit, would you like to step in? Sure. And first of all, hello, everyone, whoever like the three people listening to this uh, are. <laughs> also, also, it's been great to just like hang out with all of you guys who are all people I love and admire a lot. So, so that's great. Now, you know, one of the things I will add to Elise before getting to how I convinced her, uh, and I should I should confess by kicking the can down the road first and saying that even I wasn't convinced myself and Ahmed Ragab convinced me <laughs> to do this. And so if I get it horribly wrong, Ahmed is to blame. <laughs> and, but, you know, one thing I would add to what Elise was saying about our trajectory as people who weren't trained to think of themselves as historians of science is that I've increasingly come to realize that the history of science has always been plural, and there are many traditions of history of science out there. Not all of them have always converged at ISIS, but neither have they been completely cut off from ISIS. So I'll just uh, give two examples to make my point. I was just writing a, a piece for a fresh shift for Ranajit Guha, the uh, famed founder of Subaltern Studies, who recently passed away. And the point I was making is that like, if you look at the original subaltern collective within which I was trained, about half of them wrote on science and medicine. And people just think of, a lot of people know about the subaltern studies, but they think of it as doing like French theory, doing peasant history, doing post-colonial studies, but they don't think of it as doing history of science. Whereas like at least four out of the original nine people involved wrote books on history of science and medicine. So there is a there are multiple traditions, and I'm, I can name many more such, which have thrived and which have produced scholars within their own traditions. But that's sort of not been that those worlds have not always converged at ISIS. Similarly, like going back and looking at the back issues of ISIS, I realized that one of the first associate editors that George Sarton had back in the 19 teens was the chemist Sir P. C. Ray, who wrote a problematic book called The History of Hindu Chemistry. And I was I didn't know that he, he is somebody that I've criticized a lot in my writing. In a, not criticized, but he's a historical actor that I've contextualized and I don't agree with a lot of things he said. But I 
I hadn't known that he had been part of like the founding generation of ISIS. So these histories are neither entirely separate from ISIS, nor have they entirely converged into ISIS. So my ambition would be to have more of a dialogue within people who think of themselves as historians of science and medicine, but are trained in very different traditions. Recently, Fatih Fan, our president, organized a fabulous meeting at uh, Taipei that was hosted very generously by the Academia Sinica. And it was one of the best meetings I've been to. And, you know, because a lot of the people there were people like me who were trained in, they were all historians of medicine and science, but they weren't doing the work exactly the kind of work that ISIS is publishing. Their questions were different. And I thought the conversation, not that they should all be publishing in ISIS. I, I think it's good that there are other other journals out there as well that are publishing this stuff. But but it would be good to have like conversations. And so I think one of the key things in our vision is having more of these kind of regional kind of get togethers that might not produce any written thing, but that allows for some degree of conversation between these very different traditions, because I think history of science is already many and it, it is a pluriverse. Can I ask a follow-up question for Elise and Projit? I, I will start with a story. We were part of some panel. Elise was, and I, I, it was years ago. And I remember Elise saying a, something about, I think, an earlier article that you had published with ISIS or that you had received reviews. And, and one of the main critiques was that the science that you were talking about in your manuscript you know, was not the science that ISIS readers would recognize. So it was your job to make that science legible to an ISIS readership. And that has stuck with me ever since. And this, whenever I write a letter, um, a decision letter, I, I sort of think about this. Like, am I asking, am I asking too much? Am I asking the wrong question that you need to conform to, you know, my or Matt and I's understanding of what the readership is rather than pushing the readership? And I know we've gotten reviews since then um, that Matt got one, I know, where the, the reviewer was like, you know what? ISIS readers aren't going to like this, but maybe they should be uncomfortable, right? Like, let's push them out of their comfort zone. And I think that that's one thing that I, I hope that the two of you do more of. <laughs> and, and I guess maybe the, the open-ended question is um, thinking about ISIS readership and, and who they are and who they should be and what is the role of the editor to, to make the readers uncomfortable. No, I can, I can have a go at that. I think, you know, it's also who is the ISIS reader? Because who is the ISIS reader is also changing. And I know in our, in, this is with the other other we that I belong to, which is like, I was also the book review editor for your team, Matt and Alex. So I was like, I, I, that's also another we I partly inhabit. And so we've talked about this several times, like, does anybody any longer sit down and read the physical ISIS from cover to cover? And we've discovered some people do, which is great, but that's like in a minority now. So there's like, there's a shift in the readership, how they read, what they read, and what will make them uncomfortable. And that's not always going to fit with, I think, what we expect. One one of the young upcoming historians of science whom I like a lot, Han Sun Siung, has a, a great argument where he, he argues basically that the dissemination narrative is basically championed by the Japanese more than the Europeans. <laughs> and, and it's like globalizing or like including more people uh, from other places who are trained in other traditions might also make us rethink who is uncomfortable about what. And this, I, I remember Carla Nappi also makes this point in, in the piece she has on translation in Bernie Lightman's Reader, where she says that we, we think a lot of translation, but we don't think of translating between different academic cultures. So if we are trying to be more inclusive and global and we're going to like have people trained in other traditions, I think that uncomfortableness might also be very, very unpredictable. Like there might be people who like, you know, in, in my crowd, we're like, oh, great. Like we're all social constructionists at some point. And then we're like, no, but there are people who are hardcore positivists as well. And there's like, how do you deal with it? And they might not be the people I thought they were. So, so I, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but Elise might have something more smart to say. Well, to follow up on uh, the example that Alex was talking about, yes, absolutely. The first time I submitted um, 
to ISIS, the reviews said once explicitly and and also in, in other kind of implicit ways, and the editor at the time reinforced this, that the problem wasn't so much with the kind of science I was talking about, but they were asking me to elaborate what is the importance of studying scientists in the modern Middle East. And I just remember reflecting on that a long time and thinking, why is it not important <laughs> to study scientists in the modern Middle East? But the way that they were couching this kind of question was, well, the general ISIS reader won't know anything about the Middle East, won't necessarily be interested. It's your job as the author to try to make it relevant to the things they think are important. And again, this part was not said explicitly, but the implication was what's important is what's been written about this in terms of American scientists and European scientists. And then, uh, you know, a few years later, I submitted a different article uh, under Matt and Alex, and I was able to see that already there is a sort of a cultural shift taking place, that that wasn't the key questions I was being asked to address in my revisions that it wasn't this matter of, oh, there's a general ISIS reader who doesn't care about your part of the world. Instead, there was already a more expansive sensibility. Uh, and this is already um, occurring just in the space of a few years. So I, I already feel optimistic about the changes that can occur within our discipline under editorial changes, especially in the kind of guidance that I think you're giving to reviewers, what to pay attention to, what counts, um, because I've also served as a reviewer for ISIS um, at this point. And I, I want to give credit to Matt and Alex, the kind of guidance that they give to reviewers is, is, is an especially important part of changing these, these kinds of exclusions that I felt the first time submitting that were already kind of fading away by the second time I submitted to ISIS. Well, I'd like to pick up on on this theme of of positive changes with changes in editorship because I'm I'm looking at Projeet and doing the math, and you and I, Alex and and Projeet and I have sat in about four four to five hundred hours of meetings at this point, just going by our weekly meetings. Uh, Projeet, as the book review editor, is is there for the whole thing, so I'd really like to know, and I'll never get a better chance to ask. Projeet, what are you grinding your teeth about and thinking, you know, like in all these meetings and thinking when I, when I'm finally holding the reins, like I will fix this first. Like what, what's your, what, what's the, the long agenda that you've been building up this whole time? I mean, you know, to be, to be perfectly honest, and I'm not making this up because you guys are friends and I'm sitting with you guys, but I would not change much at all. It was what gave me the courage when Ahmed was nudging me to take this on was what I saw you guys do. And I was like, okay, this is doable. And I would, this is great what they're doing. I completely subscribe to this. The only little thing that we have changed that I will say, and which was not your doing, but which was what happened through the pandemic was that I think there was a, like, I, I'm hoping, like I'm keeping fingers crossed that there's like, for people based at different institutions, a certain amount of vertical integration would improve efficiency because otherwise what happens is because of the pandemic, as you know, originally the plan was that the graduate assistant working in the book review office was to move to Philadelphia and I was to be based at Philadelphia and we were all going to work together. That that just like added too many, when that didn't happen, that added too many other hoops. And that's the only little logistic thing that we've changed basically with your vision. Otherwise, we're basically, there's there's no grinding or dashing of the teeth. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll just like make myself a Matt and Alex mask and put it on. Can I follow up on that though? Because Kroji, you and I have had conversations in the past about the challenges of, of getting one's book uh, reviewed by appropriate reviewers, but also of, you know, potentially as, as book review editor, no doubt you have also seen it from the other side, right? Of um, how do you find appropriate reviewers for books that may be pushing the field to, you know, and, and broadening the field, but maybe the core, you know, set of, you know, kind of usual suspects in terms of, uh, you know, potential book review editors would not be appropriate um, for that book. And so I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about your experience as book review editor, those challenges and, um, you know, what, you know, what the field is learning about that. 
Ah, the raw nerve. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, Sigrid, I think I think there are a couple of couple of issues with the book review and finding a book review that I would love to touch on. One is that we often think like you and I have talked about it because both of us had like an, a, an earlier book that was reviewed poorly and by somebody who was not competent to uh, review the book. And then I saw like being on the other side, how difficult it is to actually find a reviewer who would be appropriate because the people you think are appropriate often decline. The people who pick it up are often not the right people. And then there is another issue that when there's a like the more appropriate, there's an irony and like there's a kind of optimum distance that the more perfect the match is, there's also going to be, because it's going to be a small group, there are going to be egos uh, and there's going to be a lot of history that you might not know. And then that's going to come out. Like So when you think that you've found the perfect reviewer, that's actually when most of the trouble happens. And we, like, I, I, it wouldn't be appropriate to discuss some of the, uh, some of the big flare ups we've had, <laughs> but, or, might be still having but but it's actually when people are very close in what they do that's when like a lot of the trouble begins as well because there are all these extra academic contingencies and there's i really don't know what is the best way to to actually handle this and yeah 90 percent of the letters to the editors are about book reviews and most of them are like this is terrible how is it been allowed and then from the outside it looks like this person would be a perfect reviewer for this book what could go wrong <laughs> but that's been a big issue the other new issue that's come up which i will you didn't really ask but i will sneak it in here is that the more we've tried to broaden the pool of reviewers uh, particularly with gender balance in mind because that's another issue that we've tried to address and we have successfully addressed now it's also meant that all kinds of things like postal delays, the chronic underfunding of postal services across the world, including the US, has meant that this has been a huge spanner in the wheels. Big uh, racketeer presses like Springer not trying to, not giving us review copies has been another problem. The European Union slapping completely arbitrary taxes on books that you send to reviewers, review copies has been a third problem. I mean, these are, you know, these are big, big P politics, structural questions that I didn't think would would be part of the, tackling the book review office, but they have become issues. So I wanted to take the chance now to um, open it up, you know, still further. I mean, this has been a nice, spontaneous conversation so far, but I just wondering if any of you have been thinking of questions along the way that you're dying to ask of one another, or if there are things that you feel really need to be out there that we haven't managed to touch on, um, I just invite you to uh, to jump in. I'll say one thing, and this this isn't uh, really a segue from anything that's that's gone before, except maybe from from Projit's very kind words about about Alex and me. But one of the things that's been really enormously heartening in in getting to do this work, and, and it's a privilege, is getting to to see up close um, how strong the the bonds of community in a, in our discipline are, and. You know, this. I, I went to grad school in Wisconsin, which at, at the time the history of science department was a was a, a tiny little department in a in a giant school, and it was very sort of cloistered off, and but in a good way. Um, you know, there, we all knew each other. We were all on a first name basis. Everybody knew everybody, and you know, kind of going out into the into the big wide world um, after after I left that was was a little scary. Um, even though I was here at Mississippi State with with lots of other colleagues who kind of spoke my language. So we're at a point now where we're not always sure exactly what is the value of a conference, what is the value of an article published here or there, whether it's in ISIS or or you know any of the other uh, you know many fine journals in the history of science. But from this perspective, I can it's easy to see. Um, you know, how much people care about one another, how much people care about one another's work. We don't always know how to express that sometimes these days, I think, and 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 the the modern world makes it makes it that much harder. But that that's been really delightful and, and really heartening. And like I said, it's not a good segue, but I just wanted to put that out there. I, I sometimes marvel that that I have I have very close friends 
you know, in my field, it, it feels like that shouldn't be the case. Um, but, but it is, and, and it's, it's not hard to see why, again, uh, just, just from the perspective of somebody who gets to see all of the, the amazing stuff that's out there and, and, and the way that people are working together. I love that, Matt. And I, um, it makes me think again about the, uh, practicum and the way that that is building community moving into the future generations. And so I'll just take this opportunity. These, these, um, Podcasts generally have a quiz. Uh, so um, the question that we'll be asking you today for the quiz is, you know, Alex uh, uh, earlier in the episode mentioned that uh, in setting up the practicum, they threw out the you know, call for applications for people who could participate in it. And she mentioned a number, the approximate number of applications received in the first round for the practicum. So those of you who are paying attention or who can go back and find it, what is that number? In, in order to answer the quiz, you'll need to um, send it to um, a certain email address, morgan at hssonline.org. Send your answer to the quiz there. Any further comments or questions that you have for one another, things that you think really should be in a podcast on uh, the past, present, and future of HSS publications? Any of our panelists want to chime in? Alex. Uh, I'll just say, um, I mean, Matt summed it up so nicely, so I, I almost don't want to follow, but I really just want to say thank you. Thank you to the society for this privilege of, of editing the, the journals. It, it's it's changed my life. I think it's made me a, a, a better scholar, and it certainly, I think, made me a better colleague. And I'm really excited about the incoming editorship. I can't think of, of a better team um, to take over. So I, I'm sort of nothing but but hope and enthusiasm for them. Great. Last comments from Elise or Project? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely return the compliment and not just for the sake of doing it. But like, like I said, you guys were absolutely the outgoing team were absolutely inspirational. And I, I genuinely like Elise was saying, we didn't think of ourselves as historians of science as our primary identities. We were, we were like, historians of Middle East or historians of South Asia and whatever. And I think it, it was a chance breakfast at in Berlin of all places with Alex that somehow led to my being on their team. And then I gradually learned to, and I, I don't think till I joined their team, I actually fully bought into this being a historian of science. And then, and so it was kind of, I was a complete outsider. And they, so it's, I owe whatever affiliation I have now with the field to the two of them. And, and they have really set a, very, very high bar in terms of not just public, pushing scholarship in new directions, but also being equitable and just and trying to and, and like building community and doing all those things that we aspire to do, but so often uh, forget about in the race to just publish. I will just add to what Projit said by by reinforcing that the model that Matt and Alex have set up for co-editorship is what convinced me not only that I could be important in history of science, but that I could take on a role in history of science publications. Um, so thanks again to Alex and Matt for really leading the way in this regard. Um, and thanks, of course, to Sigrid and the rest of the um, society and, and the council uh, for giving Projit and I this privilege to take on this vote of confidence. And uh, we hope very much that we'll be able to build on what Matt and Alex have done in a positive way for the field. You know, I, I think Alex and I are both deeply uncomfortable with being thanked for anything under any circumstances. So this is probably a good point um, at which to, to say what we should always be saying, which is that it really isn't Alex and me. It's Alex and me and Marshall and Giovanni and Aaron and Katie and Alex and Rose at Chicago and her predecessor, Andy and Joan Vandegrift and a thousand anonymous reviewers and so on and so forth. Um, we're, we're the very, very, very tip of the iceberg or tip of the spear, if you like. And, and we, never, we never want that to go unacknowledged. Thank you so much for that. 
And I think then we are at our closing point. So thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to all of the listeners and thank you to Fatih Fan, our president who uh, came up with this idea of the podcasts and invited us uh, to have this conversation today. It's been great.